Dr. Renee Thompson from Fostering Wellness in Rutland, Brandon, and Randolph, Vermont. And today I want to share with you guys some exciting news about your thyroid. Now I know the thyroid itself might not sound super exciting, but I'm telling you, the effects of taking good care of your thyroid are really exciting for your quality of life. The thyroid is a really important organ in our body, and it controls and helps control a lot of functions in our body. So if the thyroid isn't working quite enough or it's working too much, then a lot of the systems in our body cannot be working well. So I want to talk to you today about that, how you can improve your quality of life by taking good care of your thyroid, by taking good care of the hormones in your body, and good care of your body overall. About the thyroid, it largely affects women. A lot of women are affected by this, and they might not even know it. And again, it can present itself in a lot of different ways. So I really want to share this informa information with you, and I'm really excited for you today to learn some of this and hopefully put it to good use as soon as possible so that your quality of life can improve. So let me pull up some information here. I'm grab my slides, and we'll go through this together. I hope you're as excited as I am. All right, so first of all, we are going to go through things we need to go know about our thyroid. Um, I'm not going to necessarily say that we're going to cover everything in it today, but if you have any questions, feel free to contact our office and we can talk more in depth one on one about your specific issues. First and foremost, I want to think about where is my thyroid even located? Where is it in my body? Some of you may already know, some of you may be taking a wild guess right now, let me help you out. It's in the front of your throat, in the middle of your neck, and you can actually feel it move a little bit when you swallow. It's kind of right in front of your windpipe. So if you look at this picture here, you can see blown up that it kind of looks like a butterfly shape. There's a right lobe and a left lobe. So, there's a right lobe and a left lobe, and in the middle, it's connected across the front by what's called an isthmus. Now, what is the thyroid? What does it do? What's the major function here? Well, basically, the thyroid communicates with two different organs in your brain. These two different organs help decide um, how well the thyroid is either functioning or not functioning in the body. So if you look at this picture, in the very top of the picture, there's a hypothalamus. That basically tells your pituitary gland that it needs some more function or action from your thyroid. So that pituitary gland then sends a message to the thyroid and says, hey, we need you to work a little bit more. And when that thyroid starts to work, it actually works to rev up the engine of your body so to speak. So the thyroid is an endocrine gland. Basically, that means it's going to make a hormone that gets put into your bloodstream, goes around the body, and tells other things either what to do or helps them be able to do what they're supposed to do. So when that thyroid gland is working and making the right amount of hormones, your body systems are working really well. Let's take a look at that. The hormones it makes are called T2, T3, and T4. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But the important thing I want you to see here is that T3 is active. That's what our body uses the most to be able to rev up our engine. And T4 is something that's inactive that we need to process a little more to make it work for us. But that's largely what the thyroid makes. Now, when we're making these in the right balance and in the right order, <clears throat> we're, we're controlling our metabolism really well throughout our body. So that helps us to metabolize fats, and we can burn those as energy, which is really, really good news. And especially for women, we'd really like to burn fat as a lot of our energy. That's, that's very helpful to us. By doing this, that actually helps to regulate cholesterol in the body. Cholesterol is a molecule that's made mostly of fat. So when, we, when our cholesterol is too high or too low and our body's out of balance, 
the thyroid helps decide how much cholesterol gets burned up and how much we end up using. It also is very important in fetal development in the womb. Pregnant women need to make sure their thyroids are working as healthy as possible um, to both help the baby grow and develop physically, but its brain function, the baby's brain function will improve or diminish based on how well mommy's thyroid gland is working. And if you know our office at all, you know we take care of a lot of mommies, we take care of a lot of pregnant women, and we really like to help focus on that so mommy and baby and family stay well. Uh, the thyroid is also important in growing hair. It produces a lot of different hormones for us, helps stimulate the production of those hormones. Rather, it doesn't make them themselves, but again, it, it, it tells a signal through the bloodstream uh, to another organ to make these for us. Um, it's also largely involved in, in muscle function, both when we tighten a muscle and we contract a muscle. And it's also important in bone growth. So again, you can see how all of that really plays in to how we develop in the womb, how we develop as children. And so it's really important through our life and through our development that that thyroid gland is working really well and functioning the best it can for us. Now, if that thyroid gland, that again revs the engine of our body so our systems are working strong and powerfully for us, if it's not working so well, then we start to lose function. Um, a really, a, a major issue with that is when T3 and T4 that we mentioned earlier are not working for us the best they can. So let's see how they're supposed to work for us. Very basically, don't get overwhelmed by the big names here, by all the different letters combined um, in that first one there. T3, here's what I want you to know. That's what our body uses the most. That's what's active. T3 basically means I have three iodines attached to this molecule. T4 or thyroxine, you probably hear that um, commonly if people are talking about the thyroid. T4 has four iodines, and it's not active. I can't use that until I turn it into T3. So in the, in the thyroid gland itself, um, I'm going to make T3 and T4. I'm going to mainly make T4. Now, that sounds a little funny. If I use mostly T3, why would I make so much T4? Well, that's what the body does. So it must have a reason that it does it because the body is pretty stinking smart. But it does this by taking iodine and converting that in the thyroid into T4 and into T3. So basically, I have this iodine molecule that enters my body and generally by consumption, by based on what we eat. And our body takes that, sends the iodine to the thyroid and says, okay, I need this ingredient to make these things. I need four iodines for T4, and I need three iodines for T3. So this is kind of like an ingredient for a cake, right? If you're going to make a cake, you need the right ingredients. So the body has to have that iodine, it has to have that ingredient to make these really important molecules for us that rev up our engines, that make these important hormones. Now right away, that T3, it can go out into my bloodstream and go be active in my body. It can go tell me to burn fat, it can tell me to grow hair, it can tell my skin to be nice and smooth. But T4, it needs a little work. It has one too many iodines to have this be able to function for us. So T4 travels through that bloodstream and it enters the liver. Once it's there, it is converted into T3. Then T3 can go out and do really good stuff for me in my body. Now I want you to look at this with me. Keep your eyes on this image of the liver. When that T4 gets turned into T3, there's a really important helper that does that, and that's called selenium. You may have heard that before, but basically selenium is something that, that we should get in our diet, and it's in a lot of different types of food. But when we eat selenium, it helps us take one of the iodines off of T4 and turn it into T3. 
So let's go back to that cake analogy. I have to have iodine, one of the ingredients, to be able to make my cake, T4 and T3. Now, once my cake is made, I want to be able to eat it. That's T3. Let's eat some cake, right? T4, however, it's not ready. I can't use it. Selenium acts like the knife or the fork that I would use to get the cake out of the pan. So if I don't have enough selenium, I can't use the T4. I can't get to my cake. I can't get it out of the pan. If I don't have enough iodine, I can't even make the cake. So that's a problem. Those are two really, really important units that we need in our body to be able to make the right amount of T3 so our body's engine can be revved and working the right way. So if I don't have enough, enough of either of those, or if I'm not making enough hormones from my thyroid for some reason, what happens? Well, basically, I get this condition that is altogether too common in our society called hypothyroidism. Basically, hypothyroidism is when your thyroid isn't working enough. So the thyroid becomes sluggish. I'm not making enough hormones. That's a problem. And that actually can affect over 20 million of the Americans right now. That's already affecting them. And that's just blatant ones that have been clinically um, recorded. That's not even ones who people aren't presenting themselves. So when, I, when we think of this, what could cause that to be sluggish? What could make it to not work enough? Well, we just said iodine. If I don't have enough iodine, I don't have one of the really important ingredients to make T4 or T3. Now I could make all the T4 I want with enough iodine, but if I don't have that selenium to turn it into T3, well, I can't use it. So I can have T4 floating around like crazy, but unless I can cut my cake out of the pan, I can't have it. I can't eat it. All right. Now, some of you might find a way around that to eat your cake. I understand. Right. But this is how the body works. This is this is what we're looking for here. So in hypothyroidism, if we're looking at someone's blood work, we might see a decrease in T4, which would make sense if I don't have my thyroid working enough to make it. I might not have as much of that T4 or that thyroxine. We might also find an increase in what's called thyroid stimulating hormone. So when we think back to that picture of the brain telling the thyroid, hey, can you make more of this? We need our engine revved. That pituitary gland in the brain says, hey, I need, you, I need to stimulate you. I need you to work more. I need you to increase. And please, make more T4. We need this in our body to turn to T3. Okay? So if we see a really high increase in that thyroid stimulating hormone, that means my thyroid hasn't been working enough and it's being told to work more. That means the thyroid itself was sluggish. Now, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. While the blood work is very useful, it's, it's not entirely as accurate as it could be. Dr. Rob, Dr. Lowe, actually, who, um, who is a, a clinician and has over three decades of clinical experience in hypothyroidism, talks about this a lot, and actually um, on his website talks about how there are over 60 signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, over 60. So we're not going to go into all of those today, but I just want to point out some top ones for you so you can wonder, hey, maybe am I struggling with this, or maybe I need to do something about this. How do, how do I take care of this better? Um, and, and again, those, those signs and symptoms are really important because a lot of thypohyroidism is subclinical, which means you might go in and someone says, you know what, you do have these symptoms going on. We're going to do some blood work. Let's see if your T4 or your TSH are off. They check that out. You're kind of within the normal range of what's to be expected. So no, we're not going to do anything to help your thyroid. Well, 
again, that blood work shown in this over, you know, three decades, that's a lot of clinical experience. Over three decades of clinical experience, that blood work range isn't necessarily ideal. So looking for all these different uh, signs and symptoms is actually a better way to take a look at the thyroid and see what's happening. So let's think through that. Those hypothyroid signs, symptoms, and body signals, really, that, that, that's a better term. If you know us at all, we don't super focus on symptoms. We, we try to think about, okay, what's causing this symptom? Let's not just get rid of the symptom and cover it up, but what's causing it? Why is your body signaling you that there's this dysfunction? So I want to think more about these body signals versus the symptoms. First and foremost, people with hypothyroidism generally have an increase in fatigue. And I mean fatigue, tired, exhausted, can't get moving. It's unrelenting. Even when I get a good night's sleep, I just can't seem to get up and get going. It's like you're geared up for your day. You know what you need to do. You know what needs to happen, but you just have trouble even getting yourself to physically do it. And meanwhile, you feel like you're just beating your head against a wall because you're not getting anywhere. And no matter what you do, you feel like you just can't get that same energy back, that kind of fatigue. The next prominent thing is weight gain. Weight gain. Now we all know this. We all know when we gain weight. And women, we are our own worst critics. No one has to tell us we even gained two pounds. We know it's there. We know it's happened. Now, this weight gain that I'm talking about with hypothyroidism, this isn't, oh, the holidays just went through and I gained a few pounds. All right? This is, I'm working out, I'm exercising, I'm exhausted, but I'm making myself do it. I'm eating. I cleaned up my diet, but I'm eating clean food. I'm focusing on what I'm eating. I'm drinking more water. I'm trying to sleep at night, and I'm still gaining weight. That is not okay, and that is not healthy for your body. If you're exercising and eating well, you should not continue to pack on the pounds. Now, you might gain a little weight in muscle mass, and that's a different thing. But if you're gaining fat tissue, that's a problem. <clears throat> Dry skin. Dry skin isn't always thought of when people think of hypothyroidism, but if you're having chronic dry skin, that thyroid isn't working for you to be able to metabolize the fats or to give the nutrients you need to your skin to be able to work the best you can. Hair loss, dry flaky hair or hair loss is again another sign of that thyroid not functioning well. And especially in women, Male pattern baldness is one thing for hair loss, but in women, hair loss is a whole different thing. Generally, uh, women's hair won't be lost. It might thin a little bit as they mature and as they age and as some of those hormones change, but they shouldn't be having hair loss or baldness patterns happening. That means something deeper is happening, and hypothyroidism might be one of those reasons. Cold. If you are feeling very sensitive to the cold, you can't seem to get warm. You bundle up when other people are taking off their jackets. It, that can be a sign of hypothyroidism. Your, um, again, thyroid works to increase the metabolism, the functions, the systems of your body. And that should keep you warm when that engine is revved. If it's not being revved enough, you're going to be chilly. Now, on the other side of this, when you do try to exercise, you might not sweat enough. You might be someone who, oh, I don't sweat or I just glisten, right? When we are working hard, our body should sweat and that is good for us. It decreases toxins and it means our systems are functioning better. So fatigue, weight loss, dry skin, hair loss, being cold, all of these together point someone toward thinking that thyroid isn't working enough. A few more things um, wor worth mentioning here to think about and see if they hit you personally 
leaky gut issues, gut issues in general, if we're not absorbing nutrients well, if our intestines or our colon is inflamed, if we struggle with constipation, that's an issue. That means that means our 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 organs again those those muscles aren't able to work and contract and squeeze the way that they should um, a leaky gut issue actually can lead to the thyroid having issues because I'm not absorbing the nutrients properly I might not be absorbing iodine the way I should I might not be absorbing selenium the way I should meanwhile my thyroid starts to suffer that means other organs that depend on that thyroid to, to get hormones from it, they start to suffer. So that starts to go throughout my whole body. When that happens, when I'm having um, nutrient deficiencies, when I'm having leaky gut, now, now just quickly, I'm not going to really get into this, but that leaky gut, you, your gut, your intestines should be like a tight mesh work nice and snug so nothing is able to fit through except the exact things i want to fit through at the right time so i can pull that iodine i could pull that selenium through and put it where i need it in my body now that leaky gut is not a meshwork it's like a big broad open net and big chunks of stuff are flying through that goes places and that's so to speak okay stick with me here but those chunks of food or inflammatory things or stuff that should never cross the gut crosses into my bloodstream that goes around my body stresses the thyroid stresses other things causes inflammation and that chronic long-term inflammation can lead to autoimmune disease which basically means my own immune system attacks me that's not okay in any way shape or form so if we're having gut issues if we're having autoimmune disease issues we need to be looking to the thyroid and saying okay what's the health of the thyroid what's happening here and how do i heal this leaky gut so i'm not stressing my thyroid more so those are important things to be considering muscle aches trigger points fibromyalgia all three of these play really uh, big into that thyroid function. Usually when we think of working a muscle, we think, oh, I'm gonna squeeze that muscle tight and I'm gonna squeeze with all the energy I have and I'm gonna make it nice and tight and nice and short and I'm gonna contract it. Now I'm gonna relax. And we think of that squeeze tight with all my energy. We think of that as using energy, as being an active process. We forget that the relaxation part of it is also an active process. That active process needs fuel. It needs fuel. And one of the things that fuels our body and tells it how to break down fats for energy is our thyroid and that thyroid hormone. So again, it's really important that thyroid hormone be in balance when we're looking at people with muscle aches, with trigger points that are just unrelenting, or with fibromyalgia. Now, leaky gut issues, thyroid issues, nervous system issues, those are all intricate intricately intricately intertwined and that all plays into fibromyalgia but people with fibromyalgia should definitely be being checked um, for appropriate function of the thyroid adrenal fatigue cholesterol issues diabetic issues the irregular menstrual cycle issues are all signs of hypothyroidism and all of those have to do with irregular hormone function and it's that thyroid that makes the right hormone that goes and tells other organs that make hormones how to do that or how to help do that. And so if the thyroid is not working well, we can have these other hormonal issues start to show up. Even something as simple as premature gray hair and gum disease can even be signs of hypothyroidism. So again, there are over 60 signs and symptoms. And if you want to talk about that more one-on-one, -on -one, we can do that. But right off the bat, the ones we've mentioned, um, again, weight gain, fatigue, dry skin, hair loss, being cold, the ones you see in front of you, these are all signs that something might be going on with your thyroid and that should be being checked. So then if that's hypothyroidism and my thyroid's not working enough, what's hyperthyroidism? Well, hyper means it's working 
too much. It's working overtime. I have an abundance of T3 and T4, um, which basically means my whole body is speeding up. My engine is being revved almost non-stop. Long term, can we sustain continuously revving that engine? No. We also can't sustain it not being revved enough. We have to find that right in between. Now, hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism are pretty much, or they are, opposites. They're opposites. So one, it's not working enough. One, it's working overtime. So I want to kind of put that next to you, next to each other for you. Hashimoto's is, is a disease and Graves disease um, as well. Uh, they're opposites here. Hashimoto's on the left is a case of hypothyroidism where the thyroid is not working enough. It's actually uh, very similar in all the signs and symptoms to just flat out hypothyroidism. The difference here is Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease. So again, that auto means self and immune is like your immune system and disease means dis-ease. We are away from ease. This is not functioning properly. So that self-immune system is not working properly. It's actually attacking myself. When my immune system is attacking something, then I have antibodies that are high in my bloodstream. So in Hashimoto's, the body is actually attacking the thyroid system. And so you see those antibodies being higher in, in, uh, in blood work. And you also see similar signs and symptoms, if not the exact same ones, to hypothyroidism. Graves disease, on the other hand, is where the thyroid function is over time. It is too much. This is hyperthyroidism to severe detriment of the body. Okay, so this basically is speeding up all the functions of that body. When that happens, people can have anxiety, irritability. They have frequent bowels or loose stools. This is a, a minor feeling of this is you're going to have a big test or you're going to have a big um, presentation at work or you're going to go meet someone for the first time that you're really nervous about meeting and those bowels can become frequent. Except for these people, it's consistent. It's all the time. This is a severe hyperthyroidism. These people are heat sensitive, so it's opposite. They kind of, they're kind of sweating. You know, sitting in a freezing cold room, sweating when everyone else is under a blanket. They might have weight loss because they're chewing up those fats and metabolizing that fat over time. Um, they're they have so much T3 in their system that they're just burning through cholesterol. Again, if it's revving all your systems, it's revving up your heart. That heartbeat increases. Your hands might be shaken. In severe cases of Graves' disease, some people might have exophthalmosis, which basically, basically is, uh, is bulging of the eyes. If uh, the thyroid, again, is made to rev your engine, then it kind of can uh, swell up muscles. And the muscles behind the eyes swell a little bit and kind of make your eyes look like they're protruding from your face a little bit. Graves' disease is more common in women under the age of 40, whereas hypothyroidism is more common in women over the age of 60. But again, those are most of the documented cases um, and more based on blood work, not necessarily based on signs and symptoms of what someone's going through day-to-day, uh, -day, what's happening with them, and more than just for a week. You know, what's going on for the last several months? What's going on for the last year, several years? What's happening? Let's look at the whole scope of your life and see, all right, um, are you having adrenal fatigue? You know, if you are, why? Is your thyroid not giving it the right signals? Are you having gut issues? Do you have leaky gut issues that have now stressed thyroid function because it's not getting what it needs from the gut? And now we have adrenal fatigue or now we have um, um, uh, inability to focus and we have overall fatigue. What's happening there? So again, we need to look at all of these within the scope of a person's life. So when you start looking at these signs and symptoms and you think, okay, so how do I know? How do I know if, if some of these signs and symptoms are, are related to my thyroid or not? 
Well, a really easy test to be able to do at home is to check your basal body temperature. Now, some women, you might be familiar with this or you've heard of this, and men, you might be familiar as well, but a lot of women will use this test um, to check when they ovulate, and it, and it helps with uh, checking fertility, uh, uh, both for you know when you're trying to have a baby and when you're trying not to have a baby. So when you take this test, it's really important that your body has been at rest. So generally, you would take this first thing in the morning, and your body needs to have rested or slept very minimum of three hours. But if you sleep a whole night through and you take this temperature in the morning, normal should be right around 98.6. We know that. We know we take our temperature. It should be around 98.6. So if that temperature has dropped a whole degree and it's 97.6 or lower for at least three days in a row, that could at least indicate that your thyroid is now becoming sluggish, that it's not working enough. Remember that thyroid revs the engine, speeds things up, gets it working, gets it moving. When that happens, I should be warm when my engine is revved. If it's not working enough, if I'm not metabolizing enough, my temperature is going to drop. And again, this isn't, oh, today I'm really cold and, and today my temperature is low and I, and I don't really know what's happening. This is a sustained temperature that's low. So again, for at least three days <clears throat> that this is happening. And women look this up a little bit too. Um, and there are different charts that you can look up. You can Google Barnes Basal Body Temperature Test and come up with a chart and compare that to what your temperatures might be when you're ovulating or not, because our temperature tends to swing a little bit more than a man's, but it shouldn't really be swinging more than a degree. But, but look that up and compare that so you can see what it might be for you personally. Okay, some other tests that are traditionally done and definitely worth considering are blood work tests. Now, I said earlier that the blood work isn't always completely effective, and that's true, but it at least gives us a baseline to, to start thinking about and see if anything is really drastically blatantly off. So when we look at these tests, TSH, okay, that thyroid stimulating hormone, Again, that comes from the brain and says to the thyroid, hey, I'm stimulating you to make more. You're not working enough, right? So if that's high, then we're thinking, okay, my thyroid isn't working enough because my brain's keeping having to tell it to make more, all right? Now, if I'm not making enough T3 and T4, I have to ask myself, why? Do I not have enough iodine to put into my thyroid to make the molecules I need to make that cake? Do I not have enough selenium to be able to cut the cake out of the pan and make it so I can get to it and use it? Okay, so another really good test to look at is free T4 and free T3. Now we want those within a certain range, but at the same time, it's really important to look at that T3 because that's the active form that I can actually use, right? So I want that to be within a certain range, knowing that I can use this and make that work for my body. Now, other tests are thyroid antibody tests. And basically, again, those antibodies are to see, am I attacking myself? Am I attacking my thyroid? Do I have antibodies against my thyroid? Because again, what's causing that? What chronic inflammation do I have that my body would want to attack itself? Again, the body is really smart. It's crazy smart. It goes from a sperm and an egg, and nine months later, we have a whole human. That's pretty stinking smart. It's done everything for you every day of your life to keep you alive in every situation you've been in to today. That's a really smart body. So why would it attack itself? There's got to be some kind of inflammation there prolonged that your body starts to attack it. So we have to ask what is causing that? How do I correct that? Not just cover it up, okay? Now this last one, TRH, basically that comes um, from really high up in your brain and that tells your pituitary gland uh, to tell the thyroid to, to make more hormone. This is kind of like schoolyard gossip, 
Okay, this is, hey, I like so-and-so. Will you go tell him I like him and see if he likes me too, right? Kind of, kind of a silly way to put it, but it's true. The, the hypothalamus says, you know what, hey, 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 pituitary gland, please go tell the thyroid to, to make more hormones because we need our engine revved. We need this to work more. So that's how that's working. So if we have a high amount of that saying, hey, go tell them to do this, then that means, again, our thyroid not, might not be working the best that it can. So what treatments are that for this usually? Well, some pharmaceutical treatments that are used pretty broad in a clinical setting are things like Synthroid. And maybe you've heard this before, but that Synthroid, uh, the Syn means synthetic right it's man-made right and all of these all of this list here that's that's man-made and basically that's a it's a form of thyroxine which is t4 now stay with me don't let these words throw you this is very basic we have something that's synthetic that wants to look like and act like t4 so when I take the blood work in the future, it looks like my T4 is good. Now the problem is, if I have T4 now, that's good, but why didn't I have it before? Did I not have enough iodines to put four of them onto the T, so to speak, right? Do I, did I need more iodine? And now that I have all that T4, was the problem actually that I couldn't get it to make T3? Because now I have all this synthetic or, or um, all this synthetic T4, and I still have to send it to my liver to make T3. So is that process working? Do I have the selenium to cut off that iodine and make T3? Can I get my cake out of the pan? Okay. So when I look at that, again, that, that's a problem. And when we're taking just T4, that might not work well with our body. Our thyroid makes T2, T3, and T4. Now, T3 and T4, we've talked about. T2 is the one that scientists don't know a lot about yet. So, so we kind of think, well, we don't know how important it is. But again, body is smart. And if it's making T2, it's probably for a really good reason. So it's really good when you're taking something to supplement with um, for a thyroid hormone that it has not just T4, but it also has T2 and T3 in it. So when we have that T3, T4 combination, that just works better for our body. And again, if I don't have enough selenium, if I don't have enough iodine, if I don't have the stuff I need to be able to make the hormone itself, then or convert it from one to the other, then, then I'm still not going to get as much benefit from those synthetics as I could. Armor thyroid is something that's been used. And, and in the past, um, the research was it, it wasn't super stable. And, here, and here's why. It's from it's from bovine, so it's from it's from cows, okay? And it's thyroid hormone from cows that can be used to supplement in humans. Now the tricky thing was how much of what T two, T three, T four did the cow have, and so that was variable. But in the last about ten years, this has become more stable, and they're able to stabilize this more. So that armor thyroid or a bovine source. Is, is usually a better supplement or a better treatment to use. Um, and again, you would talk to your medical doctor about this, but that's a better treatment to use. That way you have the combination of T2, T3, and T4. You're giving your body the things that it would make on its own if it can't make them. Now again, we always wanna think back to why can't it make it? Why didn't that happen? And what could be the cause of that, okay? <laughs> So one thing that has always a huge effect in our body and causes either good or bad is food. So does food affect my thyroid gland? Oh my word, yes, yes, you better believe it. Food has a huge effect on your body and food doesn't care about you. 
I'm sorry to tell you, we love food. I've already talked about cake more than once, right? Now, if you talk to me, I will tell you a good, clean recipe to make a tasty cake that's not going to be hard on your body, okay? But we love food. We get emotional, emotional about food. We have relationships, and, and we base those around when we eat with people because we love food. But it doesn't have the same love for us in return. It's either good for our body or it's bad for our body. It's really one or the other, okay? So this food has a huge effect on what it does to our body. And it plays a major role um, in that thyroid function. There are five specific foods that are really, really, uh, foods and, and, uh, and, and, and other things here that, that can be combined into food or on food or around food that can stress your thyroid function. So right away, gluten. And you've heard about this in the media and it is everywhere, but gluten is an inflammatory food. And if you are someone who suffers with leaky gut or bowel issues, gluten is gonna wreak havoc not only on your gut, but it's gonna cross through that big broad net and go and cause inflammation all over your body. And again, that chronic inflammation leads to chronic diseases and it stresses the function of that thyroid. Soy is another big one. Um, isothiocyanates, big word, basically, these are, these are certain foods that have a structure that in them that interferes with your thyroid function. So it, it either messes with how many iodines you pick up or it messes with processes in the liver that keep me from making those hormones the right way. Um, these these um, molecules are found mostly in cruciferous veggies. So you can read it there, but broccoli, broccolini, cauliflower, kale, mustard greens. And we hear that and we're like, but those are good for you. Those are all good for you. I should be eating those. I eat those all the time. I make my kids eat their broccoli, right? Well, I'm not telling you don't eat these. But what I'm telling you is there are some, there are some things in them that can mess with your thyroid. So if you are having thyroid issues and you're still wanting to receive some nutritional and mineral benefit and enzyme benefit from these veggies, warm them. Just warm them up. Don't not eat them at all, but warm them a little bit, you know, keep a little crunch in there. But warming them actually helps to break down those isothiocyanates so that they're not getting in the way of your thyroid or your liver making what it's supposed to make. Pesticides. Pesticides, we know. We hear about it. These are, these are ugly chemicals that don't break down, that bind to a lot of different tissues, a lot of different organs in our body, and definitely mess with the way we use iodine and the way that we use selenium and other pathways in our liver to make these. And the last one, fireworks. Fireworks can mess with your thyroid gland. Kind of random, right? So we think. But basically, here's what happens. Fireworks have rocket fuel. They got to launch them up somehow. And that rocket fuel is intense. All right. That it's called perchlorate. And that perchlorate, again, um, uh, if it settles on our food and it's, and it's found other places too, the perchlorate isn't just in fireworks, but it's a big thing used in fireworks. Again, that affects with our thyroid um, working with the right ingredients it needs to, uh, to be able to make the hormones we need to be able to function properly. All right, I just want to hit these quickly. Gluten, again, we mentioned it. It's an inflammatory food. Um, it can cross the gut if we have malabsorption issues. When that happens, our adrenals get stressed. Our thyroid gets stressed. And that prolonged inflammation there and that abnormal balance in our hormones can all lead to uh, a, a highly stressful situation in our body that can even lead to autoimmune disease or dysfunction. And actually most people who have almost any type of autoimmune disease, interestingly, also have a sensitivity to gluten. Okay, so if your gut is not as leaky and you are gonna consume gluten, generally it is recommended that you consume gluten from a sprouted grain source. It's processed a little differently and it's not as hard on your belly. Um, the brand I like to use if I'm going to have gluten uh, in, a, in a bread uh, is Ezekiel bread. And again, that's a sprouted wheat bread. So there's some other nutrients there, um, but I'm not having the harsh, harsh reaction of gluten. Also, some people can tolerate uh, 
fermented sourdough cultures fermented more than 15 to you know 18 hours in there and that really decreases the gluten content to uh, less than 20 parts per million if you're someone who counts your gluten all right unfermented soy foods now there's been some hubbub in the media soy is it good is it bad what's the deal basically soy when it's fermented is good for the body when it's not fermented it can actually um, mess with some of our hormone production and interfere with that and cause hormonal disturbances in the body which again can stress the adrenal glands which stresses the thyroid or it can directly stress the thyroid which intricately works with our adrenal glands to make hormones for us and then they get stressed so it works works both ways there so again if you're picking a soy pick it fermented and that's a better way to go for your body now three and four here of the goitrogenic foods um, uh, water and halides that are added to our water and to our food so i want you to think of this as a family situation halide is the name of a family it's like your last name so for instance my last name is thompson there are four people in my family me my husband and our two kids we're all thompsons and that's fantastic but we all have a different first name halide family is similar iodine bromine chlorine and fluorine are all members of the halide family which means to a certain extent they're different my kids they look different, but they have similar eye color. They have a similar smile. There are things that they share in common. If you even look at the names, halide, iodide, bromide, chloride, fluoride, that tells you they're all part of this same family. Now the problem is the bromine, chlorine, and fluorine can all compete for space in your thyroid with iodine. Well, that iodine, we said, is an, is an essential ingredient to be able to make T3 and T4, to be able to make that cake that I want. If someone comes in and takes away one of my cake ingredients and just throws something else on the counter as an ingredient, that's not okay with me, all right? Think of it this way. I have a lock, and for that lock, I have a certain key. The key fits the lock perfectly. And I want that key in that lock to unlock that lock. You with me so far? Now say I have a different key. It doesn't fit. It's not gonna work. This isn't gonna happen, right? So basically the lock is like my thyroid and it wants to use that iodine, that gold key, to be able to, uh, to, be able to use that iodine to make T3 and T4. If it sees something that doesn't look like it iodine at all, it's not going to use that. Well, now I say I have this other molecule, but it's part of the halide family. So part of it looks different and part of it looks similar. So you and your siblings don't look exactly alike, but again, you might share the same eye color. So part of you does look similar. So this means that bromine, chlorine, or fluorine can go in and get in that lock, and now my iodine cannot. So I can't even use it. It's competing for space. Now, chlorine um, can be added to water. And at, in that process, it, it, it is consumed in what we drink. It's put over our skin when we shower, when we bathe, when we brush our teeth. Fluorine, similarly, that's a problem. That's hard on the body. It's a neurotoxin. It affects the way even our nervous system is developing as we grow. Now, bromine is a tricky source. It can be found all over the place. It can be found in premixed flowers, and, and it's, it's thrown into, that, into those bags there that you might just think, oh, okay, well, this is just a mix of a few kinds of flowers and not even know it's in there. It can be thrown into sodas, and this is the BVO there. You can see that as BVOs in an ingredients list or brominated vegetable oils, and that's thrown in soda. How gross. And that comes into our body and that takes the space that we needed for our iodine to work. And then our thyroid isn't working the way it should. It starts to become sluggish and that's a problem. So when we look at those foods and we look at those um, 
things to cut out, to be careful of that gluten, to look for soys that are unfermented, to get water uh, that's filtered or that's clean or that is fluoride and chlorine free, to not be drinking sodas in general, okay, and be reading ingredients lists to look for those bromines, then we have to think, okay, if that's the stuff I'm avoiding, then what should I be eating? What do I need? So nutrients uh, that are really good for your thyroid, I bet you can guess the first one, iodine. This is huge, right? We can't make it, so we have to consume it. We could use a supplement for this, and there are some really good supplements for this, but the best way to get any nutrient is through your food. Then it's within the whole scope of the food. We absorb it better, and we break it down better, and we use it better. So some food sources for iodine are seafoods. Again, sprouted wheat breads, if you're going to go the wheat route for iodine, that way you don't have the same irritants from the gluten. Meat, and this is all, all different kinds of meat. Um, if we're thinking beef, lamb, um, pork, chicken, iodine comes from all those sources. Eggs, dairy is actually also a good source um, because it's from animals, and so we can get it from there. In, as far as supplements that are concerned, if you do need a supplement, if you do need something a little extra to increase your iodine, SSK drop, SSKI drops are very easy. Basically, you drop this a few drops on your arm and it absorbs really quickly. The iodine does and that gets absorbed into your bloodstream and used in your body. Um, thyrosol is actually a really nice supplement that the Metagenics brand carries and if you're familiar with our office you know we use a different a couple different nutraceutical companies um, to help people who might need some addition to their uh, dietary intake in the form of a supplement and metagenics is a really nice brand with that and we carry that here uh, you can actually go to our website fosteringwellness.net and look at the metagenics list if you do if you are thinking about hypothyroid um, issues talk to us, talk to your medical doctor, see if this is something that can work with you, for you. I do like the thyrosol because it also includes other ingredients in it that are really helpful to, to helping your, your thyroid overall. Selenium, again, this is important. That liver has to have it to be able to get that uh, T4 active into T3. Blueberries are a really good source for this. And actually, selenium is really, really good for your gut as well at mending um, leaky gut issues and kind of closing and making tighter that net in your gut, making it closer to that mesh work it should be. This is also found in some seafoods, mainly um, tuna, sometimes oysters. Um, it's also high in, in seeds and nuts, specifically Brazil nuts. Um, and again, in meat and eggs, and, and uh, it, it should be able to be easily consumed enough in our diet that we don't necessarily need to supplement with it. Manganese, again, this is really easy to get in our diet. This is good for thyroid function um, and how it processes iodine. And again, that can be found in grains and legumes. So um, even things like lentils um, and, and greens, just green leafy veggies. I don't generally recommend supplementing with this because it is something that you can become toxic with pretty quickly. So basically, if you're eating green leafy veggies, some legumes, and you're every once in a while having some sprouted grain um, breads, you're probably fine on your manganese. But this is one that really helps the helps the function of that thyroid. Vitamin D, and let's be honest, what doesn't vitamin D help, right? It's great for your immune system. It is super beneficial for your nervous system, for healing. It is active in most of the functions of your body. Um, it's a huge thing, and really the best way to get it is good old-fashioned sunshine. Sunshine, so seriously, outside, take a break, take a walk, have a breather, sit in a chair, read a book, and really, I would recommend it daily, but but to get enough vitamin D, at least in the summertime, especially where we are in New England, um, 15 to 20 minutes a day, three to four days a week um, is good. You do wanna try to get some midday sun. Uh, if you're gonna be directly in the sun, 
you want to be careful between the 12 and the 3 o'clock hour. That can be pretty intense for your skin, the way the sun shines there. And I don't really want you to slather on extra chemicals onto your body in the form of sunscreen. So if you're out in mid-morning or after 3 o'clock and you go for a short walk, um, you should be okay. You know, obviously don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to be sunburned. But get that sunshine and get some fresh air. Iron, this, this only makes sense, right? If the thyroid is, a, is an organ that makes hormones that have to travel through the bloodstream, well, the blood better be working. And we know our red blood cells contain iron, so we need iron there. But it also, specifically in the thyroid, helps to make, to create the T3 and the T4. So that T3 can go right out and be active and do great things in our body, and that T4 can head to the liver to get processed um, using that selenium to turn into T3 and go be more active. So just a quick recap, things in general that are good for my thyroid so I can get these nutrients are seafoods, those sprouted grains, nuts and seeds. Those are also a really, really good source of healthy fats for us. And remember that thyroid tells our body to burn fat for fuel. That's really good for our brain. It's really good for sustained energy. Um, clean meats, and by that I mean free-range chicken, grass-fed beef. Uh, if you're having pork, uh, it should be from a rooting pork or pig, not, you know, not one being just necessarily fed from a bag, all right? Um, if you're going dairy, uh, raw is really, really good. Uh, the vitamins and probiotics in it are really positive. Again, find a farmer who knows how to do this if you're going to go raw with your dairy. Um, and goat's milk uh, tends to be less inflammatory overall to humans because it's, it's closer and more similar in structure to human milk. And coconut oil. And again, what is coconut oil not good for, right? It's kind of like vitamin D. Vitamin D and coconut oil go a long way to, to help our overall immune system function. Our nervous system gives us good energy, helps us to heal. And again, that coconut oil helps with um, fatty acid production in the thyroid and in the liver in processing thyroid hormone. So besides food, besides supplements, besides pharmaceutical drugs, what can I just do to help my thyroid? Relax. Stress is a major problem for the thyroid. Stress, chronic stress can wear it out. And too much stress, making it work overtime, it wears it out short term, but it kind of gives us this hyperthyroid short term reaction. So really good ways to take care of this are things like reflexology, massage work, saunas, and actually saunas are really good at detoxing the body as well. Um, and again, some of those toxins we consume in our food and in our water uh, can fight for space for that iodine. So we don't want that in there. We want those toxins out and it's relaxing. Exercise. Now I'm going to tell you something. We all know we need to move. We all know we need to exercise. We need to get out, take that walk, get the sunshine, get the fresh air. It's good for us. But for even, even for the thyroid to help de-stress, if you have one of those squishy, nervous relaxation balls that you just kind of hold in your hand and you just slowly pulse it and relax, that even just in the middle of your day can be an exercise that can help your thyroid move toward normal. It's something that is clinically shown to relax your body and to help your thyroid function to normalize. Acupuncture is another really good way just to help bring balance to the body um, and to help that thyroid function better. Now our office loves uh, these. We specifically on our own work with things like massage and exercise. We recommend um, people to different reflexologists and acupuncturists. Um, and we know that these are things that are good for us, but we are a chiropractic office and chiropractic focuses on the health of the nervous system. So just like that thyroid gland is really important in, um, making a hormone that dumps into the bloodstream and goes and tells other organs how to, how to function or how to help them. The nervous system controls the coordination of all of that right even up into the brain where that uh, hypothalamus and pituitary gland work to tell the thyroid what to do. 
So again, that brain is what's controlling the entire body. That nervous system is the master system of the body and it controls and coordinates all the functions in the body. So when we're in the nervous system, our goal as chiropractors is to reduce any interference in that so that brain can talk to the body better, so that gut heals better, so that it squeezes better in those intestines and in the right order, so that the heart beats at the right rate, so that the thyroid gland itself is talking to the brain to be able to heal itself better and also um, regulate its function in thyroid hormone even better. That brain needs to be able to talk to the liver. We need that inner interference out of that master system and it's a really non-invasive approach to be able to get that to work and again when you're when you're getting that brain talking to the body better that starts to bring balance in all of your systems it moves you toward normal so when we think of those systems we have the skeletal system the muscular system uh, the cardiovascular system our lymphatic system and it's our nervous system that's controlling and coordinating all of those together so as important as that thyroid is, and as, as much as it can change everything in the body, again, over 60 signs and symptoms, it's that nervous system that actually even controls more and is coordinating that. So your chiropractic care reduces stress in that nervous system, which reduces stress in that body, which starts to bring balance overall, and it helps us absorb our nutrients better and brings us back toward that normal healthy state so if you have any questions on this if you have anything you want to talk about give our office a call again you can call us at fostering wellness or con find our contact information at fosteringwellness.net you can schedule to come in and just talk about your thyroid um, you can you can come in and you can talk to us about different ways to um, be able to get under chiropractic care if you've never been under chiropractic care you haven't had your nervous system checked for the kind of interference we look for if you're somewhere not anywhere close to our office i would recommend finding a chiropractor who can help you with um, clearing your nervous system and more of a corrective and wellness based care and i would also recommend that you find someone who does do work um, with nutritional balance in their office as that nutrition is really huge that exercise is really huge that mental attitude is really huge at helping keep interference out of that nervous system as that chiropractor helps you work toward correction in that so anyway i hope you found this information useful i hope you did find some of it exciting thinking through this and how you can move forward even tomorrow in ways you can move and you can eat and you can think to be able to help your thyroid function better again if you have any questions uh, feel free to give us a call i've enjoyed this i hope you all have a powerful day and that your quality of life is about to improve have a great one